Vice President of the Sainsbury Event Trust and a longtime member and past president of the Sainsbury Garden Club. Uh, she's a former environmental scientist. She holds an MS from Duke University of Canada and a BA from Miami University of Ohio in physical, geography, and geology. So, Marjorie. Thank you. Thank you for having me here tonight. And I think I'll, once I get myself untangled, there we are. All right, can you all hear me? Yeah. Yes, good. All right, so tonight, I know you, I saw some lovely pictures of flowers up there. But I want you to think about in your pollinator gardens to go beyond the flowers, there is a lot more. I am in our native areas, we have, you know, we used to have these. We didn't have to plant pollinator gardens because these are what were in our meadows. And Connecticut used to have, thank you. That's great. Yes, that's a lot better. We used to have that, yeah. All right, all right, that's good. We used to have a lot of meadows, but a lot of the meadows have grown up into thickets and then they grew up into forests. So we don't have very many meadows anymore. And the things that we don't have in meadow, we have done this to. Um, and if you were a pollinator, there'd really be nothing there for you. Oh, wait, wait, look. There is, I think, there are some flowers there. But there's not enough there for anything. Um, and of course, if it does grow, we chop it down. And we, we have early training programs here. <laughs> so we're really good at doing that. But it's really kind of staggering. 8% of Connecticut is now covered in grass. And of course, this is not native grass. This is grass that came from elsewhere. Um, and that's more land that we have in grass than we have in farm fields, which is really quite staggering. Um, and I love this picture. Of course, you know how easy it is to care for grass. So you can put up your hammock. And maybe, if you're not taking care of the grass, you can rest in the hammock. But you see, nobody is resting in that hammock. Um, and of course, you, when we think of flower gardens or pollinator gardens, we tend to think of things like this. They're, they're going to be showy, like the, the magazines. They're always in bloom. Um, and, but 90% of these flowers do require assistance from pollinators. So. The older I get, the, the more disinterested I am in the perennials because they can be a lot of work. And some of them get kind of pushy and push the other ones out. Then I end up with just one thing. Um, but you know, they do require digging and, and dividing and manipulating, but it's hard work. So my, my go-to now is shrubs, shrubs and tr small trees. And they have a tremendous value in for pollinators. Think about it, the amount of footprint that one little tree takes up. I don't know why this is going in and out. The, the footprint of the tree, it's got a huge volume for that one tree, or a huge volume of flowers for the same footprint of just a few flowers. Um, so in a, it's, you know, it's, it's especially important to have shrubs and things because you know, people tidy up their gardens, and this is not a particularly good thing to do if you want pollinators. A lot of the insects will winter over in the debris. Um, it's better to leave the plants standing, um, but that's not what the garden books tell us to do. Everything needs to be cleaned up. So the trees and the shrubs do provide a whole lot more to the pollinators than just the flowering plants. They also provide roosting and nesting sites for some of the birds, and they provide nectar, but they also provide berries. Anything that flowers is going to make some sort of a fruit, and that provides food for other things. And many of our native trees and shrubs are host plants for a lot of different uh, butterflies. Uh, so you don't even really have to think about providing the host plants in your, in your flower garden. The trees will do it. Uh, the interesting thing is you also have to think about where the pollinators are going at different times of the year. Some butterflies overwinter as eggs. You can see them right there. And some as chrysalis. And some will even overwinter under the bark of trees as adults, like the morning cloak butterfly. And some of our nesting bees will nest either in the ground or they'll nest in some of the woody sh um, branches of shrubs like the raspberry cane here, and this other little boring solitary bee. So it also makes a difference when you prune your shrubs. So I know we're anxious to get into our gardens and pruning is good, but look out for those little holes because there are some of the pollinators that are in there. So all right, what are we looking, when we talk about pollinators, we usually think about the honeybee. 
And that is a very important pollinator. But as you know, the honeybees came over in about 1622. They were brought over by the colonists from Europe to pollinate the crops that they also brought over. They're good pollinators, but we have over 300 native bees. And I love the names, sweat bees, mining bees, plaster bees, cuckoo bees. I mean, these are great bees. And we have so many of them. And they're even better at pollinating. And he's, I love the fact that you can measure the pollinator efficiency. That's how many times it visited the flower and did it, did it actually result in pollination of the flower. So the honeybees are only 72%, but our native bees are 92% or 91%. Now, why is that? Well, and sadly, we're also losing some of our bumblebees or, and, and some of our native bees. Uh, four different species have vanished in the last 20 years, and the scientists are trying to find out why. We haven't been studying our native bees all that much. But we want our, bum we want our bees. And I love this picture of a bee covered in pollen. And you know that pollen will actually fly onto the bee. Pollen has an electrostatic charge. When a bee is flying through the air, it picks up a positive charge. The earth has a negative charge. The flowers have a negative charge. And when the bee comes near the, the flower, its little hairs all stand on end, sort of like when you rub a balloon against your hair. You get that thing. And the pollen will actually jump up to it. And the bees will know whether to visit a flower or not, because if the other bees have been visiting this flower, there's no electric static charge. They don't get that little buzz, and they just fly right by. Nature has all these signals for the plants. So this one's been flying nearby, and he's got lots of pollen. And then different bees pollinate in different ways. Some are buzz pollinators. The bumblebees are buzz pollinators. When they go near a flower, like the, the blueberry or the potato flower, these guys have their their pollen in a little tube that has to be shaken out. It cannot just be um, accessed. It's not going to fly up under the bumblebee most of the time. And our honeybees cannot provide that buzz pollination. Uh, in greenhouses where they're growing tomato plants, the, the, the farmers have to bring bumblebees in to pollinate the tomato plants. The tomato plants are a native plant, so are our squash. We actually have squash bees that pollinate our squash plants. So we also have long and short-tongued bees. So the design of the flower is designed for a particular kind of bee. Now, they're not the only pollinators we have. We also have beautiful butterflies. And here's the one that's, this will be the first butterfly of spring. This is the, it's not upside down. That's the way you often see them on a tree. And they will come out about now, long before the trees have leaves, they will come out and they follow the yellow-bellied sapsuckers around. The yellow sapsuckers make holes in the trees. The sap comes out and they drink up the sap. And that's how they, they get their nectar or their, their sugar fix. But we have beautiful butterflies who are pollinators. And then we also have some other beautiful moths. We shouldn't forget these. Although some of these, very sadly, these guys don't have a mouth. So they're not interested in nectar. They're really only interested in mating. They're only open for, uh, um, they're only alive for a few days. This one, the clear winged sphinx moth, I remember the first time I saw it, I thought, what a strange looking hummingbird that is. Um, because they fly the same way, but they have this wonderfully long mouth part that can get into the nectar. And they will pollinate flowers with a lovely tube-like shape. And then, of course, there are other, other pollinators. Beetles are good pollinators. Um, and mosquitoes, the male mosquitoes, drink nectar from flowers. So if you get bitten, you're being bitten by a female mosquito. The males don't do that. They don't need that extra protein to make their eggs. Well, we're losing our insects. This is a big issue. We are losing them because we are killing off the plants that the animals like very indiscriminately. A lot of things that we think are weeds are great pollinator plants. And then here, I love this, kills 100 insects. Doesn't tell you what kind. And some, most insects are very beneficial. And of course, you've all heard about the neonicotinoids. Um, and there's some evidence that the bees are actually sort of addicted to the neonicotinoids because they're nicotine. They get addicted to it, um, but it, it's very hard on the bees. There's been some implications that they are causing some of the bee declines. Or it might just be all of these things, lack of habitat, the, the pesticides, all these various things. So it's tough out there for the bees. So what can we do? Well, the easiest and the best and the most efficient thing is to plant natives 
to support um, native pollinators. And I could end right there, and that, that would be the end of the talk. That's all you need to know. Just plant native plants. But we'll go in a little deeper. Do you remember this from third grade? <laughs> I love this. We teach that now at the Nature Center, and I see signs, the things like this, and I say, look at this. There's something dreadfully wrong with this diagram that we all learned in third grade. For one thing, there's no sun. And for another, there are no decomposers. But the main thing I have a problem with this is this. That's it. Grass. Well, no, they don't all eat grass. Um, and only one plant and so many animals? It should be the other way around. There should be a whole lot of plants and a few anim a fewer animals. We tend to get what I call green myopia. One plant's as good as the other, but it's not. And then we also have to remember another thing that we learned probably in kindergarten, the life cycle of these insects. Caterpillars don't eat the same thing the butterflies eat, so you have to have leaves with holes in it in order to have the butterflies. So one of the most common butterflies around here is the great spangled fritillary. I love that name. And as a caterpillar, they will only eat violet leaves. How many of you have violets in your yard? All right. What's wrong with the ones that don't have violets? In your yard? You should have violets in your yard. It's really hard to get rid of violets in your yard. They have a wonderful way of making extra flowers that you can't even see that will make seeds as well. But because we have so many violets in our yard, it provides the food for the Great Spangled Fritillary caterpillar, which will only eat violet leaves. You know that book, that Eric Carle book, that said the hungry, hungry caterpillar? Nonsense. <laughs> Most of them will only eat one kind of plant or one sort. Some will be a little adventurous and eat a lot, but they're very picky. So if you have violets, you will have this butterfly, and you've probably seen this butterfly in your yard. But the main reason for planting the native plants has been explained by Douglas Talamay. How many of you have read this book? Oh, please rush upstairs. There are probably copies, and you can go get that. This is the most revolutionary garden book that I've read in the last few years. Douglas Talamay, if you ever had a chance, he's a wonderful speaker. He um, is a university professor of entomology, and he had heard that you need to plant native plants. But he said, why? And of course, like a scientist, he decided, I'm going to measure it. So what he did in his property is he measured how many native plants, how many caterpillars and insects could he find on the native plants, and how many could he find on the non-native plants, the beautiful plants that we've brought in from around the world because they're so beautiful. And what he found was really staggering. He found out that on the native woody plants, they have 35 times more caterpillars, biomass, that's if you added all of the caterpillars up and weighed them, than the non-native woody plants. And for most gardeners, this is a horrifying thought. Oh my gosh, I'm going to have caterpillars eating everything. But you won't, because they will find them. That's their job. They're looking for them, especially in the spring, when they're raising their young. They, have, they know exactly where those caterpillars are hiding. So here we've got a, a mother chickadee. She has a nice little caterpillar. Caterpillars are the way nature converts leaves into nice little packages of protein for the little creatures that are growing. So she's got this caterpillar, and she's got a choice. Which mouth is she going to feed? This is a sight that makes mother's birds cringe. They don't like to see those mouths open. That means they're hungry. So she's got this caterpillar, and she's going to give it to which one do you think? The one with the biggest mouth. I think it's that one. And then that one will be fine, and he'll go to sleep. So off comes, off comes the male with another caterpillar, and she'll probably feed it to the next one. And they'll work their way down the line until they get to the smallest one. And hopefully, he will get a caterpillar before he wakes up. Because <laughs> if he wakes up, that one's not going to get the caterpillar. He will. So if there are not enough caterpillars to go around, the baby birds don't all survive. And just out of curiosity, how many caterpillars do you think it takes to raise one nest of baby birds? That's a lot of work. The mother and par the parent birds are up from the time the sun comes up to the time the sun goes down for three weeks. They are just flying nonstop. It is exhausting work, but they need those caterpillars. Unfortunately, in our yards, we have planted things that don't provide any caterpillars. 
that don't provide any food. They're gorgeous, but they don't do any work. And what the long and the short of Doug Talamay's book is that native vegetation, in areas where you have native vegetation, you have more bird species and more birds. And the corollary is true. When you have non-native vegetation, such as we have mostly in our yards, we have fewer birds. So it disrupts the food chain, that food chart that we saw earlier. And the native plants give just the right food at just the right size at just the right time of the year. Here's a yellow rump warbler. They come through, they come um, on their migration south in the fall, and they will strip a bayberry bush clear of all their, of all their berries. And their berries have got a nice high fat content so they can have the energy to make their, their southern migration so they can come back again next spring. And where we have non-native berries or non-native um, flowering plants, like the non-native honeysuckle, it can affect a lot of things that you wouldn't really expect. Birds get their pigment from their, for their feathers from some of the things they eat. And in the areas where they have a lot of these non-native honeysuckles with these lovely orangey red berries, it affects the color of some birds. Like the cedar waxwing, it's supposed to have a yellow tip tail, but in areas where they have high concentrations of these honeysuckles, the tail turns orange which doesn't seem like a very big thing to us. But if you're a female cedar waxwing, you're gonna look at him and say, what the heck is wrong with him? <laughs> and he's gonna miss out on the breeding season that year. So, so it's very specific, you know, a lot of these things tie together. Even the bees, certain bees only like to pollinate or mostly like to pollinate certain flowers. They're awake at a certain time of the year and the flowers are designed for those bees. And so here you have a little trout lily and it's got the Latin name and the Latin name is the same one in the minor bee. So you know that there's a connection there. So here's what we will be seeing in a few weeks time. Maybe next week they'll start coming out. And, and they're, they're lovely and yellow for a few weeks, and here they are. But you don't find many bees going near them, and if you do, it doesn't seem to work because you never see any seeds. These things do not spread by seed. This plant, to me, reminds me of this. <laughs> Some people find it very attractive. I don't know what it's for. It doesn't do any work. It can't get its fur messed up. I'd much prefer to see their plants as working plants in our garden. Something more along this line. Something that does something all year long, not just one splash of incredible yellow. You want something that's going to work, something that's going to give nesting sites, that's going to give bare, uh, flowers that can be pollinated for the pollinator garden, then something's going to make a fruit that somebody else can eat. Um, so you want that plant to work all year long not just be a showy little thing at one time of the year. So the, the encouragement is plant native plants, but what is a native plant? Well, the loose definition is it's something that's inhabited the particular region for thousands of years. Remember, 12,000 years ago, we were covered with ice. So it's things that have sort of worked their way out in the last thousand years. Now you can have something that's native to the United States, but of course something from the, the deserts of Arizona is not gonna be particularly suited to here. So you can have something native to New England, but something from the coast is not going to do well up in, in Simsbury necessarily. So you want something that's native to the type of ecosystem or habitat that we have here. So let's go through some examples. Here's one that's listed as a native plant, Father Giller. It's a beautiful plant, lovely plant, and the bees do like it. But it's native to the United States, but not to New England. And how do you know this? Well, you can go to the United States plant database, it's the United States Ag Department of Agriculture plant database, and you can see the map where it's from. So if you go to that website, you can find out what, where that plant is supposed to be. Here's another plant, I love this one. I had a lovely one outside my house. Um, it makes wonderful berries, it's, it's heavenly. The scent is gorgeous, it comes out around Father's Day. And this is where it's from, oh look. It's in Massachusetts, but it's not in Connecticut. That's just odd. Maybe someone missed Connecticut when they were sampling. Um, but here's another one, sweet pepper bush, Clethranifolia. Lovely plant, blooms in, the, in the, um, about August. Um, you don't get that many flowering things at that time, uh, but it's a heavenly scent. The bees love it. Um, so where is it from? All right, here's a bush of it. And here, there we go. Ah, look, it's in Connecticut. But then you can dive deeper. Where in Connecticut? 
Well, for some reason, it's not in Litchfield County. But I don't know. I don't know. Maybe I think you could still use it in Litchfield County. It's close enough. You don't have to be too pure about it. So what should we plant? Well, you know, you get all these questions. I've got a yard, and what should I plant? Well, there are books now. This is Native Plants of the Northeast by Donald Leopold. He's a professor of um, landscape architecture in Syracuse University, and he compiled all the different kinds of native plants in the Northeast. Wonderful, because everybody's yard's different, everybody's soil condition's different, the water condition are different. You need to have a, a, a choice, and he, he sets it out very nicely. I would imagine they have this book in the library too, but it's a great reference book. So one of the things, instead of forsythia, we'll be seeing in a few weeks, is northern spice bush, Lindera benzoin. It's called benzoin because that's the chemical that the plant makes. If you ever take the, the um, leaves of the spice bush and you crush them up, it's a wonderful lemony, soapy scent. And that's how the plant protects itself from being eaten by too many animals. However, there is an animal that loves it, and that is the, um, the spice bush swallowtail. So anytime you have the name of the animal and the plant together, you know that that's what it needs. That's a spice bush caterpillar. I mean, a butterfly. It has a wonderful caterpillar that eats the green leaves from the spice bush. And this lovely little caterpillar is just fun because when it's young and it's just come out of its egg and it hasn't eaten very much of the, the, the leaves, it hasn't concentrated the chemical in it um, into its body. And so it's, it still tastes, it's a tasty little caterpillar. So it disguises itself to look like a bird dropping. <laughs> the birds leave it alone, surprisingly. And then as it ages, it goes through what they call instars. It has to shed its skin, grow bigger, shed its skin, grow bigger. It goes through about five or six of those. And near the end stage, it looks like a snake. And a bird coming upon it would see these great big eyes. That's just on one side. That's not an eye. That's a fake eye spot to trick. It will even raise up on its hind legs to look like a snake and the birds will leave it alone. And if that doesn't happen, it's got another, I don't have a picture of it, but it will actually have these two little fleshy type horns that will come out of its head and it will absolutely reek of spice bush. And that will make some of them leave it alone. But after the flowers have been pollinated by the bees, and this is an early bloomer, so the bees that are just waking, and the native bees that are just waking up from hibernation, they can go there, get their, their, their pollen and nectar fix. And then later in the season, there are all these red berries. And you don't really see them very much because the birds do and they will strip the bush clean. So it's not a bush that you'd have for decorative berries, but it's one that will attract birds to your yard. Next one in the spring would be the American pussy willows with those lovely, lovely catkins, which the squirrels like to eat. And when they bloom, here it is, the, the bees come for the pollen. This is wind pollinated, but they still come for the pollen. This is a beautiful plant. I'd love to see more of them planted around because I've found that the children at the Nature Center don't know what pussy willows are anymore. So sad. So, and then shortly after that, we get this gorgeous plant called shadblow or serviceberry. It was, um, um, it was called serviceberry because it bloomed about the time that the ground was soft enough to bury the people who had died over the winter. It's not a nice name, but shad blow is nicer. I think that's when the shad used to come migrating up the rivers. Um, but it's, it, it's a very petite plant. I mean, it's, it's an understory sort of plant. It, the, it, it's no trouble in the landscape. It has small leaves. They tend to lose its leaves a little earlier. They have lovely color in the fall, um, but you don't have to, it's not a lot of raking underneath. And the petals are very, very, you know, not the messy like the crab apple petals. But the best thing about it is it very quickly sets to and makes flowers. So it's also called Juneberry. And these, I mean not flowers, berries. These berries ripen at various stages and it's just a really high concentration sugar fix for the poor exhausted parent birds who are shuttling the caterpillars back and forth to the nest. So it blooms at just the right time. This is a plant that I got to know and love when I was at college in southern Ohio. There were red buds everywhere, and I thought, oh, they're not going to bloom here, but they do. That's a lovely tree. It's, has, it's in the pea family, um, and here you see a cardinal eating the berries to get a little extra pigment for its feathers. Um, the bees go nuts for this. You, if, in the spring, you can hear them just buzzing around, and then after it's pollinated, it makes these wonderful seed pods, 
And one summer day, I was sitting under my tree, and I heard this crack, 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 crack. And it was the birds cracking open the seed pods and eating the seeds. That was fun. And of course, the flowering dogwood. What a great plant that is. Now, the problem, everyone says, well, it can have the thra thracnose disease. But there's a reason for that. Um, it's usually because it's planted next to the, co uh, the Kusa dogwood, which is resistant to the anthracnose but can carry the anthracnose. So here you see the bee. The bee is visiting. These are the flowers. These are just petals. I mean, these are just bracts. These are modified leaves. But the real flowers are in there. And you can see it's collected the, the um, pollen. And in our sort of shady f forested lawns, this is a great one at the edge of the yard, um, at the edge of the trees. It's an understory tree. And here's why we want to plant the flowering dogwood, the Cornus florida, rather than the uh, Cusa dogwood. These are the berries for the Cusa dogwood. They are the sign that just fits beautifully into most songbirds' mouth. These are the ones from the Cusa dogwood. These are the ones that form a nice messy mass underneath the tree. These, these were designed for birds, and these ones were designed for the monkeys. Now, we can't eat these, but we can eat the Kusa dogwood berries. Supposedly, you know, you don't eat the skin, you just sort of squeeze it and then spit out all the seeds. Supposedly, they're delicious, um, but these were designed, all these different native plants were designed for different creatures, and we don't have monkeys, so we don't need the Kusa dogwood tree. But the, the, the birds love the berries, which we can't eat, from the dogwood tree. And speaking of dogwood, in our area, we have a lot of different types of dogwood, and these are two of my favorites, the silky and the gray dogwood. Now, they, they form colonies, nice clumps, and they have wonderful flowers, bunches of flowers that the bees absolutely adore, and then they make berries, and the birds love them. The ones that they like even more, I think, are the silky dogwood, um, and here you can see the berries are white and they're on red stems. This plant is saying to the birds, please, please come eat me. These birds can see in ultraviolet light, we can't, but these, these would just like shine out like eat at Joe's, you know, open, <laughs> come get me. Um, these birds will eat them and they will be stripped. As soon as they're ripe, they're practically gone. You don't get to see them very often, but the birds love them. And of course, then there are the, the red osier and the golden osier dogwoods, which provide wonderful winter color. But again, they have the flowers and the berries and, and the winter color, everything. They are the complete package. They have the leaves that the caterpillars can eat. The um, spring azure butterfly loves the dogwoods. And then there's another one, possum haw, viburnum nudum, which has spectacular fall colors. Again, berries, again, flowers, again, leaves that are edible. So a lot of the viburnums, unfortunately, some, the, uh, the uh, viburnum, the arrowwood viburnum, has a lot of, um, there's an insect problem on that one, a non-native insect that seems to be disturbing it. But there are many, many viburnums. There are also a lot of viburnums that are from Asia and, and other places that you can get in the nurseries. So you have to you know, really specify which kind you want. Um, so... It's a, it, it, there are a lot, there's a huge number of viburnums. Be careful which one, because you want the native one. If you have a wet area, you probably would like to have a button bush. I love the flowers on this one. To me, I'm showing my age, it looks a little bit like Sputnik, what I think Sputnik should look like. <laughs> it's got all these things that are sticking out. And then, so the butterflies really enjoy this one. The caterpillars will eat the leaves. And then at the end of the season, after the, the flower has been pollinated, it makes a seed that some of the ground birds will like to eat. And while we're talking about down on the ground, here's New Jersey tea, with the gray um, hair streak. And look, you can see the little, anything that you, anytime you see a little hole in your leaf, anytime you see a bee or a butterfly or a beetle, visiting the flower, you know that something good is going on. But even better when it makes berries, and then those berries get eaten by the birds, carried farther away, they pass through the bird's digestive tract, and come out somewhere in the woodlands as a nice little fertilized package to start a new plant. It's lovely when your native plants start spreading into the woodlands. It's awful when your non-native wood plants start spreading into the woodlands, because they're, they're going to take over because nobody's eating them, and they're not part of the food chain, and they're not going to help the ecosystem. So instead of burning bush, I have a saying, friends don't let friends plant burning bush. 
or, again showing my age, better dead than red. <laughs> Except for blueberries. Blueberries, um, all the high blush and the low blush blueberries actually turn a spectacular red. But you do get a berry. Yes, you get berries in the, the, the um, burning bush. But those are the ones that get into our woodlands. And I know at the Nature Center, one of my jobs is to find things for our community service people to do. These are not volunteer community service people. These are people who are court-ordered community <laughs> service people. And my job is to find things for them to do, and I have them pull out burning bush that's in our woods. Um, and I know that that is one cohort of the population that will never plant burning bush in their own yards <laughs> after they've pulled them out of ours. Um, and th again, the, the different flowers attract different things. Here's a bumblebee pollinating that, but sometimes the poor bumblebees, their tongues aren't long enough. So I love the carpenter bees. Have you ever seen on a blueberry you have these little holes? On the side, you ever wondered, what in earth is making all those? Those are the carpenter bees. They're cheating. They get their, their tongues are too short, so they drill a little hole in the side of the flower and drink the nectar. So, speaking of nectar, honeysuckle. We have a northern honeysuckle. It's a great plant. It only stands about uh, three feet tall. It's, it makes a great edging plant. Uh, the new, new varieties have the sort of bronzy color, and it makes a lovely little flower that you can see the bees are enjoying. But this is the one that's supposed to be here. Oh, and this is another spring flowering tree. Sometimes we, we forget about our trees as being uh, really good pollinators. The tulip tree has a fantastic tulip-like flower. You never see it because it's way up high. But just because we don't see the, the bees pollinating, it doesn't mean they don't. They're pollinating it way up there. And the sassafras, this is that fun one that has the, the two lobes or the one lobe or no lobes at all. And this one has a wonderful scent. But in the spring, it's another one that has this gorgeous chartreuse set of flowers that the bees absolutely like. And it's the one that the, the caterpillars for the swallowtails and the Promethean silk moth will eat the leaves of that tree. Wouldn't you like to see that in your yard? I mean, that's, that's a thumb right there. These are huge moths. And then in the spring, this is one that will bloom, the Pinksterberry azalea. It's a deciduous rhododendron, or azalea, um, and it blooms without the hindrance of all those leaves around, so it doesn't mute the colors. And these beautiful flowers, look how they're beautifully designed. This is not designed for a bee. Look where the, the stamens and anthers are. They are designed that the, the, this butterfly, with its long tongue, will reach down, get some nectar, and all the while its, it's, its abdomen is being rubbed and the pollen is being deposited on the abdomen of the, flower, of the butterfly. And we have several azaleas. Um, here's a swamp azalea. It has a wonderful long tube, so again, you can think the pollinator is going to have a long tongue for that one. And then there's this one, Rhodora, which is kind of a dull name for this beautiful uh, native rhododendron. And this one doesn't have those long tubes, and it looks very delicate, unlike some of our rhododendrons, which look like they're on steroids. <laughs> Speaking of non-steroidal, this is the Virginia rose. A lovely native rose. We have several. We've got a swamp rose um, and the Carolina rose. This, but these are the native ones. And when you see a flower, try to think like a pollinator. Think like a bee. Which one would you want to go to? This one has a landing pad. It tells you, <laughs> I'm open for business. This one, what the heck is going on? It's got a lot of petals. Now, it seems attractive to us. But think about, think like a plant. You have so much sun, so much water, so, much re so many resources, and you can either put them into the leaves and grow, you can put them into the nectar, you can put them into flower petals, but if you put them in that much into flower petals, is there going to be anything left for the nectar? Probably not. Some plants will make smaller flowers, just for like the smaller butterflies to come and visit. These are choke cherries. You can actually boil them up and eat them, but Think of the tree that's covered with flowers like that. That's going to be a whole lot more for pollinators than any little flower garden down on the, on, down on the ground. And spireas. We have native spireas. This is meadowsweet. There's a spirea alba or tomatosa. Um, one's pink, one's white. Um, but these are lovely. They have the same leaf as the, the spirea, but it blooms at the right time for our pollinators. And it's a, a beautiful addition. Forms a nice clump. And if you really want flowers, how about a hedge of elderberry? Yeah. Look at all those. I mean, those flowers are like dinner plates. 
Um, and there are lots of insects that will pollinate them. As you can see, they're pollinated because you can see lots and lots of fruit. They're a bit leggy in the wintertime, but to wait for those, those glorious um, berries, and then you will get all sorts of birds coming to eat those berries. And if you don't like the green leaves, you could go for, they've got cultivars now. Here's Black Beauty. But cultivars, let's just talk about them. This looks very nice. I think the flowers don't look as good. But the cultivars, the scientists have found out that the cultivars, well, what, when we breed a flower to look good for us, it doesn't necessarily look good for the pollinators. So here we have a cardinal flower. This hummingbird is coming. But this, this plant, again, has had a decision. Shall I make lots and lots of flower petals and not as much nectar? And that's what we've told it to do. But over here, it's made a few flower petals, but it's made really high quality nectar. Here's one of my favorite plants, staghorn sumac. Most people think, oh my gosh, this is poisonous. No, it's not. The poison sumac's not even in the same family. So this is a spectacular plant. My sister lives in England. When I go visit her, I walk around her neighborhood. There are people with staghorn sumacs as specimen plants in their front yard. That's nothing that you see here. They're spectacular, though. They're wonderfully architectural. They have fantastic uh, fall color and these lovely red berries on the top. These are the flowers, and bees love them. So, you know, we don't tend to think of the flowers on the staghorn sumac, but then they will eventually turn into berries. So anytime you see a berry, you know there's a flower there. And this is a really important source of food for bluebirds. Um, it's also for, for many different birds in the wintertime. They will come and eat those berries. And you can eat them too. You can make a lovely, what they used to call Indian lemonade. It makes a nice pink lemonade. It's very tart and refreshing, but don't leave them for the birds. And then here's fragrant sumac, it's a low grow. This is a, fan, a lovely ground cover on a hilly dry slope. It turns bright red. It is a little disturbing in the fact that its leaves look a little bit like poison ivy, but they're not, you won't get a rash from them. Again, the bees like the flowers. And while we're down on the ground, common bayberry. They're a little, it's in, in the um, blueberry family uh, in the heath. And anytime you can see the, the, the flowers turn into fruit, that means the pollination has gone on. So we really don't need to overthink this. Anytime you see something with a fruit, pollination is going on. American hazelnut, this is a fun plant. It's a little coarse, looks a little witty, forms a great clump. If you've got an area where you want to have a nice stand of these, um, it's got great fall colors. This is it in the, it's not non, sort of nondescript in the summertime. It does have these catkins, which some of the, uh, the bees will come and get the pollen from. And then it makes these little tiny, very petite hazelnuts, which you can eat, but you probably won't be able to because the squirrels and the chipmunks will get them before you do. And they come in these beautiful little packages, which turn brown, and it almost looks like a little brown paper bag wrapped around, uh, you know, with, the, with the nut inside. And then getting on towards the end of the season, we have witch hazel. And we should all have a witch hazel in our yard because after all, Connecticut is the witch hazel capital of the world. So it grows really well here in Connecticut. And these, this is the fall color. These are the little seed pods, um, uh, but these are the flowers. And they will bloom uh, November, late October, November, December. Um, there is another kind of, uh, this is the Virginiana, but there is a vern, vernalis, vernal uh, witch hazel. Um, and it will bloom sort of in the middle of winter. It will bloom around February, and you can go outside on a snowy day that's a little bit warmer than usual, and suddenly you can smell this heavily fragrant, very, very fragrant uh, flower aroma, which you haven't been able to smell for, for months. Remember, in Connecticut, we're, we're flowerless and um, colorless, really, for about six months of the year. After the leaves fall off, we see gray and black and brown and white and beige. And that's why we get so excited about spring. But when you, this, is, this is another little um, spring azure that likes to feed on the leaves. And the fun thing about these, these are the seed pods. And when they uh, are ready to, uh, to, uh, to disperse its seeds, they, can, they erupt and they throw the seeds about 30 feet away. The people that harvest witch hazel for, uh, for cosmetics and other, you know, the, the high-priced cosmetics that use witch hazels, um, they say when they're harvesting, they can hear these things zinging by. <laughs> and the neat thing is that it's, it's also the host plant 
for this most magnificent of moths. This is the Luna moth. And it, this picture doesn't do it justice. They are spectacular. Their, their antennae are sort of golden. And they have a beautiful two little, little eye spots there. It's the most wonderful thing. So anything to encourage them. And they don't really pollinate, but they're just great to have around. And then in the wintertime, the winterberry. Uh, they, again, if you see the berries, you probably never recognize the flowers. These are the little flowers that grow along the stem. So anywhere you see this, the berry, that's where a little flower was. And the bees, again, like these flowers in the spring. But this time of the year at the Nature Center, we start getting a lot of calls saying, you know, we just had some snow and the robins have come back. They never really went far. And then what are they going to eat? The worms are still under the snow and people are very worried that they eat the winter berries. These are the berries of last resort. I like to think of them as the lima beans of the, the, the <laughs> berry world. Um, I don't like lima beans that much. So these are the berries that they'll eat if there's nothing else to eat. Um, and they will come in, flocks of them will come in, just strip that plant, unless it happens to be a nice spring, in which case they found something else to eat and they don't need to. And sometimes the berries will last all the year until they're kind of pushed off the tree. But most of the time, the birds are so grateful for something. And that's the thing with a pollinator garden, with a bird garden, you want to have plants that bloom all year long, that provide fruit all year long, that provide leaves as much as you can for all those caterpillars so we can have the baby birds. And nowadays there are actually books that talk about the American garden and, and different styles of garden. You can get one for grassland garden, prairie gardens. This is the wood, American woodland gardens. Um, and how lovely. When I first started gardening, it was all books from England, and they told us how to do gar English gardens, and none of the plants from around here. Fascinatingly, when I go and visit my sister again and go to her nurseries, they have plants that we have here growing wild in her nursery. They have goldenrod, and my sister planted goldenrod in her garden. I thought, well, that's interesting. Um, <laughs> But it's, you know, goldenrod is a fantastic pollinator plant and also a fantastic plant for all sorts of insects. So plant it in your garden. If they're doing it over in England, it must be very trendy. So, <laughs> so, so do it over here. Um, but there's lots of plants that I see there. And then when she comes over here, she sees plants from, from over there. Although it's hard to tell what's native anymore in England because it's all been changed about. Um, they've brought in so many things from around the world. So one of the things I just want to encourage you, you have a choice this year when you go out to the nurseries. Go and buy native plants. They're no harder to plant than a non-native plant. They're just as easy. And there are various places around the state. Some of them are harder to get to. Some of them, you know, Woodbury, Earth Tones. How many of you have been to Earth Tones in Woodbury? Take your GPS. It's, it's difficult to find, but well worthwhile. They do native plants, and they will give you great advice as to what to plant. Um, New England wetland plant in Massachusetts is more of a wholesale, but they can do it. Um, New England Wildflower Society, Nassami uh, Farm, or either Framingham. How many of you have been to the Garden in the Woods in Framingham? Make a trip. In the next few weeks, you know, when the spring comes, the flowers will be out. Make a trip to Framingham. It's not that far. And you will see these native plants in situ. You will see how they can be used in a garden. It is a wonderful trip. And, it, and even if you miss the spring blooms, you can go later in the season, go to the, uh, um, in the summertime. There's always something happening in a native garden because there are plants, I mean, there are insects and birds and other animals that need these plants. Um, and then if you can't get there, if you really want to plant other things that are native to the area, sort of, or, or mostly, American Beauties. That is a wonderful opportunity. As for American Beauties, they are, um, they are produced by, these are plants that are uh, grown by the, it's in Durham, and it's, which plant, it's the Pride's Corner, Pride's Corner. And they, they are trying to make market these native plants for the people. It's no good if, you know, you want to buy native plants and you, you go to the nurseries and there aren't any, what we need to do is, we, it needs to be, no pun intended, a grassroots movement. We need to be going and encouraging the, the, and supporting the attempts to bring native plants to our gardens. When you bring the native plants to your garden, you will, you will enliven your garden. You will bring those birds, the butterflies, all of these things, the life, the, the weird little caterpillars that have fascinating stories of their own. Our gardens should be about life, not about how to kill off certain weeds and how to you know, prune this thing back into compliance. We need to work a little less 
hard, we need to work smart in our garden. And we need to expect our plants to do something more than look pretty. So this is almost a bonus. And I just want to remind you that those were all planted by people. None of those were seeds that the birds ate and then deposited anywhere. This was intentional. We have so much forsythia now, and I know I have some in my yard that I have to take out. But as you drive up and down through Simsbury or in the surrounding areas and you see these things, think about what would have happened if instead of a plant that really doesn't do much at all, what if we'd planted something different? Think how many more birds butterflies and things we would have had if you plant something that actually does something. Like the spice bush, we'd be seeing those crazy little caterpillars, we'd see the beautiful sw black, uh, the swallowtails, um, and we'd see the birds coming and eating the berries. So it all starts with one plant. And again, as I said earlier, it's no harder to plant a native plant, but we should plant native plants. There's a really compelling reason to planting it. it. They work. They're part of the food chain. The other ones are not. They're part of the food chain back in their own country where they have things to eat them, but they don't over here. So we need to restore balance to our ecosystem, and the easiest and best and most rewarding way is by planting native plants and just starts one plant at a time. So if anything died over the winter, you have a wonderful opportunity. <laughs> to rearrange your garden. So I know the, native, the uh, Simsbury Garden Club had some lovely native shrubs on, on its plant sale. I think that one's done, but, but you know, they're still available in the nursery. The Connecticut, um, the, the Central Conservation District has a brochure. Um, you can order native plants from there. It supports a good cause. It supports the Conservation Commi uh, um, District. Um, mm -hmm. So there are lots of opportunities, but it's up to groups like the Simsbury Garden Club, up, you know, the citizens of Simsbury, or wherever you're from, to push that movement. I was just down in Wilton, uh, Connecticut, um, doing pretty much the same presentation, and uh, just a couple of days ago. And in Wilton, the town Wilton does not plant anything but native plants. We could do that in Simsbury, with a little pressure from certain groups like the Simsbury Garden Club. So I want to thank you for having me here today, and that's the end of my slides. So thank you. Any questions? Yes. Do you have a listing of some of these plants that you just talked about? I don't. Well, I do have a listing of the plants that we planted in the native, native plant garden, the bird and butterfly garden at the at Roaring Brook Nature Center. And I can show you, you know, if you come over there, I can show you some of them. It's nice to see them, but it also makes a difference where you're planting them. So I mean, I could have, I could have gone on and on and on. I mean, there's thousands of native plants. And that's one of the things that always, um, yes, we, we work so hard to try to keep a certain plant in our garden because we really like it. But there are other plants that we could fall in love with. And, and um, you know, but it all depends on your particular yard. The, the book by Donald Leopold, the, um, the Native Plants of New England, is a good guide. Um, the, uh, there's a website for the New, um, New England wetlands plant. Even though it says wetland plants, it, it's got the upland plants too. They have a very good guide on their website about plants that would be good for all sorts of locations. And even if you don't buy anything from them, they give you a good description of the plants there. And if you go to one of the native plants places like Earth Tones, just talk to the people and you tell them that I've got sandy soil in shade, I've got you know wet soils in sun or whatever it is. There's going to be a plant for you because if you'll notice, there are no blank parts out in nature. Nature's filled in everything. So there's got to be a plant for what's happening in your yard because there is in nature. Nature doesn't make mistakes like that. She doesn't say, oh, I forgot about that area. You know, everything's got a plant. Yes? What about the Connecticut basins um, at the flower show? They were handing out uh, yeah, there was a, the, shrubs and they trees. They did. Thank you, Jane. The, there is a list. The Connecticut um, Invasive Plants Working Group did have a list of various plants that were uh, suggested for butterfly gardens and plant, you know, the shrubs, shrubs, perennials, and trees. So I, I would imagine on their website, there would be a list of that. And if, no, well, actually, they have, they, they've done two things. They've said the plants we don't want, but they also have a plant saying, instead of those, you can plant these. 
and there they behave themselves. That's, that's the nice thing. Most of our native plants behave themselves because the other plants are in competition with it and they've got things that actually eat it. Eating a plant helps keep, you know, having, having something eat that plant helps keep it in control so it doesn't run amok, so to speak. Yes, yeah. Awful. No. Yeah, that was a, a, You're right. We we planted and they were there were some shrubs and there were some perennials. And when we planted, it was back in 2000. There was a terrible drought going on, and we planted it on what was our new septic system leach field, and and the the contractor put in soil on top, and it wasn't soil. It was subsoil. It had very little going for it, but we planted these things in the heat wave and drought, and we thought, well, this is just not going to work. And they did. By the, by the fall, they were up. You know, some of these plants were up that tall. Um, they, some of our native plants, know difficult conditions. They know where to grow. Some of them don't even like rich garden soil. Some of them do. So you can find a plant for your soil, for your light conditions, and for your water conditions. And they will, they will thrive. They will do very well here because they've been doing that for thousands of years. So, all right. Thank you very much. All right. Funding for Simsbury Community Television is provided in part by contributions from viewers like you. Thank you.